All right, hello everyone. We'll get started in just a few minutes here as we give everyone a moment to sign on. All right, hello everyone and welcome to Getting to Know Your LGBTQ Plus Patient presented by Dr. Julian Sanchez. My name is Renee Wright and I'm a perioperative practice specialist here at AORN. We're so excited and grateful that Dr. Sanchez accepted our invitation to speak on this important topic and share some tools that perioperative nurses can use when caring for LGBTQ Plus patients. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sanchez, a colorectal surgeon and the section chief of colorectal oncology at Moffitt Cancer Center. He is an associate professor of surgery and an associate professor of oncology at the University of South Florida, Morsani College of Medicine. Dr. Sanchez has a clinical practice devoted to the surgical care and prevention of colorectal and anal cancers. Additionally, he is the director of care equity at Moffitt Cancer Center. His clinical and research interests center around LGBT patients and cancer screening in this population. He's a member of the Society of Surgical Oncology and a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons. Dr. Sanchez sits on the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Panel for Cancer in Patients with HIV and on the diversity committees of several medical associations. Dr. Sanchez has no conflicts of interest to disclose. Please click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen and enter questions into the chat box. Dr. Sanchez will have time to answer these at the end of his presentation. If you're interested in receiving contact hours for today's event, a link for contact hours will be provided in the chat. I'll now pass it over to you, Dr. Sanchez, to begin. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Thank you for the wonderful introduction and thanks for everybody for joining us today. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart and I'm hoping we can have a little uh, interesting conversation and maybe some lively discussion after I'm, I'm all done. So just to start, as was discussed earlier, I don't have any disclosures since this is a CME talk. Um, you can register for your contact hours um, on the AORN website. Uh, and then we're gonna have a chat box. So feel free to answer, to ask any questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll get to them at the end of the talk. And also if you have any interesting stories or anything that you wanna share with the group, we're not gonna get to it during the main body of the presentation, but we can hopefully be able to get to it at the end. Um, just as another disclosure, I have all my citations listed on the slides. The pictures that I have are just uh, from Google searches, honestly, and uh, property of the web. So just to start things off, I wanted to go over some core vocabulary. I think, you know, one of the hardest things about talking about the LGBT plus community is just that, that this, you know, ever growing acronym of abbreviations and names is a little daunting when you're first getting into it. So I think it's really important to get a baseline of who we are talking about. So the first thing we should talk about is sexual orientation. And that means, well, who do you sleep with, basically? How do you, how do you describe yourself? These can be terms such as gay, straight, homosexual, heterosexual, MSM, men who sleep with men, or queer. Um, about the last two, I tend to write in my notes in the office MSM. So I'll write, you know, 65-year-old MSM. Because at the end of the day, I really don't care what they describe themselves as as much in the medical record as I do their sexual practice, because in my line of work, their sexual practice is what gives them specific risk factors for some of the things that we're looking for. So while I talk to them and in the social history, I may describe them as being gay. When it comes to the medical record, I try to keep things very clinical. Now, the word queer has gone through some evolutions over time. So depending on your age, this word queer may mean something very, very derogatory or something very easy to talk about. So in the later generations or say the older generations, the word queer was very much meant in a derogatory format. So I tend not to label patients queer unless they label themselves. In the newer TikTok generation, the word queer becomes a very acceptable term and patients will often call themselves queer. And when the patient labels themselves as queer, I follow their lead. But I don't necessarily use that word unless the patient volunteers it. Again, the label is not as important for us as clinicians as the practice. The second thing is gender identity, not to be confused with sexual orientation. Gender identity means what is your gender, obviously. So there's two forms of this. The first is transgender, which we're gonna be focusing most of our talk today. 
And that is when the patient's gender differs from what they were described, assigned at birth. For example, a baby is born, the baby comes out of the mother, and the gynecologist assigns a gender to that being. That gender is either masculine or feminine, and that is what's written on the birth record, and that is the assigned gender at birth. The patient, when they grow up, may no longer identify with that same gender that was given to them at birth, and that is patient is otherwise known as a transgender patient. A cisgender patient is a patient who agrees with the gender that they were assigned at birth. And that's gonna be the people that we're gonna not really talk a whole lot about today. We're gonna to focus our discussion on transgender patients. So just by the numbers, there we go. There's about, who are we talking about? There's about 9 million LGBT plus members in the US. Now, just for ease of the conversation, I may say LGBT, I may say LGBT+, plus, I may say the whole acronym, I may just say gay, so please bear with me as I change, because obviously it can be a mouthful. Um, according to a Gallup study and the 2013 National Health Interview Study, about three and a half to four and a half percent of the population self-identifies as members of the LGBT plus Q community. About 0.3% identify them as part of the transgender community. Now, when you break it down towards age, it makes sense that it skews toward a younger age. So while as the average age of a member of the LGBTQ plus community is about 37 years, the average age of an American is about 47.9 years. So you can see it skews towards a younger population. And when you look at it by different um, years of birth, you can see that among millennials, about 9.1% of them identify as a member of the LGBT. And in the later generation, a Gen Zer is about almost 16% of them identify as LGBT plus members. So that just goes to show you that this is a societal effect. As society has become more and more progressive, more and more people are able to identify the way they want to and feel comfortable identifying by their LGBT status. It skews a little bit more female than male, about 8% you know, more female than male. Um, and that is contrasted with same-sex behavior. So when we asked patients in this Gallup study, how do you identify? We also asked, well, have you had same-sex behavior? And as you can see, although three and a half to four and a half characterize themselves as a member of the LGBT plus community, about 8% report some, some same-sex behavior. So you can see the difference that I was talking about earlier about who you sleep with and who you identify as. Just a little background, because I think it is, it's important to at least touch on this, especially in the times of, that we're facing today. So, you know, in the 18 to 1900s, you know, homosexuality was considered illegal and immoral until really until the 1960s, you know, when you started having Stonewall, which you see the picture of here, and some of the LGBT movement, which, you know, initiated in New York. Um, it was considered a pathologic psychiatric diagnosis up until 1994. Um, the sexual liberation came of women, and with that came sexual liberation of, of uh, LGBT patients. Um, and then finally, it was taken out of the DSM, so it's no longer a psychiatric illness. Um, in 1980s is when you know AIDS came into the picture, and that was designed as or described as the gay plague, and that's when patients started dying for we didn't know what reason. Finally, you know HIV was was realized, and that was thought to be the the saving grace for some patients that made HIV care uh, much more accessible. And up until 2003, it was still illegal to be gay in 17 states in the United States. Um, legal discrimination still exists in some states. In the state, I'm in Florida. And in Florida, up until two years ago, um, anybody could be fired only because they were gay. So you could have no other reason to fire somebody, but you could legally say, I'm firing you because you are gay. And that that employer had all the all the um, rights in the state to do so. Um, with the Biden administration, a federal law came down which over, overturned this. Uh, but it is still written in our state laws that it, it can be fired for, it, and it exists in many states actually. So when we talk specifically about this population and their health, it's important to identify why they qualify as what we say a health disparity. So a health disparity means that one group of people is in a disadvantaged state when compared to the other group of people. And in the case of LGBT patients, we know that many of them lack insurance. So a little less than 18% of these patients lack insurance. There's also a lack of partner benefits. Now, some 
companies will extend partner benefits to the unmarried partner of an LGBT member, team member. But that's not guaranteed and that's not mandated. That's really up to each individual company. So as each company is becoming more and more progressive, we're seeing more partner benefits extended to other members of the community, but that's not necessary. For instance, in my own hospital, I, I work at a, a university and our own university, probably about 10 years ago, did not extend partner benefits. At that time, gay marriage was illegal in my state. So a married physician or nurse who was of same sex uh, partner could not have health insurance extended to their spouse because this was a state institution. Um, obviously things have changed, but that just goes to show how recent some of these issues have uh, come into our lives. The patients also have an issue to uh, describe some of the health disparity. So some of these patients just don't have a PCP. They don't really wanna to go to the doctor. There's an avoidance. About 30% of patients really don't consider themselves actively engaged in their own medical care. Oftentimes they do this because they don't feel welcomed or they don't feel like the patient doctor relationship exists for them. So they just shy away from it. Because of these factors, we know that the LGBT population suffers from issues worse than the regular population in the United States, making them a health disparity. Because of that, the Institute of Medicine, the American Medical Association, the National Cancer Institute, and the National Institute of Health have all labeled the LGBT population as a health disparity. Now, what this does is give funding. So when there's a health disparity research grant out there, it not only includes patients of all kinds of races and ethnicities, but also allows research to be conducted on LGBT patients. Thus, we're advancing the science in this population to try to equilibrate this health disparity and bring everybody up to the same level. So some of the risks <clears throat> these patients have is that within the community itself, there's a high risk, high rates, I should say, of smoking and drug use. This obviously leads to downstream effects in their healthcare. There's inconsistent condom use and obviously higher rates of sexually transmitted infections because of this. There's a lot of issues with body image. Body image behaviors can devastate patients psychologically and also medically. There's a lot of bulimia, anorexia, and also on the other end, where there's a lot of overweight patients in members of this community. About two times more overweight lesbian women than straight women. When we look at the reasons why overeating and less physical activity, all of this can lead to depression, anxiety, and suicide attempts. Members of the transgender community have four times more rates of suicide attempts than members of the non-transgender community. This can also lead to cardiovascular issues such as asthma, cardiovascular disease, infections like we talked about, and obviously cancer. When it comes to cancer, we think of two or three main issues that we have to address. The first is breast cancer. Women, with, mem women members of the LGBT community have an increased risk of breast cancer owing to a higher lifetime Gale score. So because their Gale score is higher, we know that they have a higher rate of breast cancer. This is in part due to the fact that they most of the time don't have children or have fewer children. Alcohol intake and obesity, as we described before, these are the biggest factors contributing to their higher rates of breast cancer. Because of that, we try to screen patients more aggressively. However, according to insurance and according to the national government, there is no increased screening mandates for this population. So it's up to us as clinicians to identify which patients fall into this higher risk bracket and maybe screen them a little bit higher. Similarly, cervical cancer is higher among lesbian women than it is among straight women. And this is kind of an interesting story. <clears throat> straight <clears throat> women have more HPV infections than lesbian women, but that does not mean that lesbian women have no HPV infection. Yes, HPV is more likely to be transmitted between a male female partner than between two female partners, but lesbian women can still get HPV infections. Because of that misconception, oftentimes lesbian women and their providers don't think of performing pap smears on these patients. So we can identify the cancer when it's in its early stage, meaning that by the time it's diagnosed, the cancer is already far more aggressive and far more advanced than it could have been had we been doing pap smears on a regular basis. When we look at the Women's Health Initiative study, about 1.3% of women who have sex with men have cervical cancer. Look at Bisexual women and lesbian women is about 2.2%, so almost double the amount. Clearly, 
the HPV in these women is going largely undetected because of factors based on the clinician and the patient themselves. So right now, we really recommend that really anyone with a cervix gets screened. I don't care who you sleep with, you have the organ, you get it screened. And you'll see this theme throughout. <clears throat> when we look at anal cancer, which is what I treat, um, this has a, a huge propensity for HIV positive gay men. So when you look at the different distributions among different groups, we can see that among straight men, about 15% of them are gonna have an HPV infection. HPV is the precursor to anal cancer. About 60% of gay men are gonna have an HPV infection that could potentially lead to anal cancer. And about 90% of HIV positive gay men have the same disease. Obviously, we have to screen that last group to be sure that they don't develop into a, that their HPV doesn't develop into a very high risk situation. The risk increases again with HIV and with the number of sexual partners. So as a gay man gets a little older, obviously these numbers and risks all increase. So we offer screening programs, high resolution anoscopy to take a look at the bottom. We will treat any lesions we see before it has a chance to turn into a cancer and hopefully prevent anal cancer in this high risk population. So back to our main topic of the LGBT, what I call alphabet soup. Um, I have a couple of terms. Um, I, you know, I often talk to the medical students, so they keep me young, I guess, and they help me identify what is cool to say and what's not cool to say. And some of the things that fall into this bracket in the LGBT group are as follows. So it's very acceptable to say somebody is gay. It's very acceptable to say in the medical record or in the written report, a man who has sex with men. It's very unacceptable say, ah, oh, that's so gay, or he acts so gay, or I don't like that, that's gay. That's all very pejorative and probably would want to stay away from it. It's very appropriate to say that a woman is lesbian. It's very appropriate to call the woman a woman who has sex with women. However, lesbianism is not a disease. It's already been taken out of the DSM, so let's not use that term either. Other acceptable terms are bi, calling someone bi, calling someone bisexual. Those are all very acceptable terms in an ally. An ally is a term of somebody who is straight cisgender, but is friends with or agrees with or supports a member of the LGBTQ plus population. Sexual orientation is the right way to say it. Often, often I hear people say sexual preference. I always remind people my standard comeback is uh, a Lady Gaga song, baby, you were born this way. It's not a preference, it's an orientation. So you would wanna stay away from using somebody's preference in this way. Um, the patient is openly gay, um, and the patient is not admitting to anything because this is, again, the way they were born. Um, it's very appropriate to say that patient is transgender. It's exceedingly not inappropriate to call somebody a transvestite or a trainee or, you know, something along those lines, which is, you know, can be kind of derogatory. Um, remember, which we'll get into this in a little bit in a minute, but transgender is more of a spectrum. It's a transition. It's not a start and stop. It's not a, a train ride that has multiple stops along the way. This is a very fluid process that has in the patient's mind what they feel is appropriate for them. So it's for the patient to decide where they start, where they stop, and where they stay. It's not for us. Again, the word queer we talked about earlier, it's very acceptable in the right setting. So again, be careful with this. Um, and questioning is a person who hasn't yet decided. So they may have tendencies towards one, towards the other. They may have be thinking, you know, they, they identify in one way or another, but they're still not quite ready to commit. Um, again, it's not a lifestyle going back to the baby you were born this way. Um, this is the way they are. It's not something that's chosen. It's not a lifestyle. It's not something you admit. This is just the way you are. Um, also easy to say, you know, two moms or two dads. And what I mean by this is I was in the pediatrician taking my kids to the pediatrician the other day and uh, the pediatrician said, okay, dads come back. Um, and that was cool because I, I felt like whoever it was calling us back really uh, understood the situation and did not say, oh, mom and dad for, you know, baby so-and-so come on back. It was a very kind of understood and very commonplace conversation which is really the point that we all want to get to. So I'd like, you, I'd like to introduce you to the genderbred person. Now, I, I'm not smart enough to have uh, come up with this on my own, so I'll give credit to the genderbred organization and Kellerman. 
Um, but this really breaks down our sexuality and who we think we are. So realistically, I'd like for everybody to go through this ex exercise because we all fall into this at some point. We are all on this spectrum, regardless of you know, how straight, how cis, how gay you are, you have some degree of everything on this, on this gender red person. So let's break it down. So I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but we'll start here at the bottom of sexually attracted to. And this is, who do you wanna sleep with? Who does your heart say you are attracted to? Are you attracted to somebody with a degree of femininity or a degree of masculinity, right? So everybody is gonna say, well, I am attracted to somebody with this much masculine energy, this much feminine energy, all right? So we all, again, we all fall into this category. And this is our sexual attraction. Next, we'll go up to the top where it says gender identity. And that's who does your brain tell you you are? Not who do the OBGYN tell you you are, not who you sleep with, but who are you? Who, do, who does your brain tell you you are? And again, everyone fits in the spectrum. I am a certain percentage of masculine and a certain percentage of feminine. It may be 100 and zero. It may be 50 and 50. That's for everyone else to, this, for everyone to decide for their own. Gender expression is, well, how do I portray to society what my identity is? That goes by clothes, that goes by makeup, that goes by the way we walk, the way we talk. Um, and gender expression is one's outward expression to the rest of society of who our gender is. Again, that could be a certain percentage of masculine and feminine. Then last is biological sex. This is, are you XX or XY? This one we can't change. Um, this really goes down to your genetics, right? What do your chromosomes tell us you are? So we can take a patient that I had recently in clinic and kind of hypothetically go through the situation. So I had a young guy come to our clinic who, uh, this is by his own admissions, uh, was gay. So he is sexually, a male sexually attracted to male. He identified himself as a male. And I asked him, well, what's your gender identity? He says, men. He expressed himself though very feminine. He had nail polish on, he wore makeup, he had a purse, he was wearing women's clothes. So in that regard, I, I kind of raised a little bit of concern on my part that I wanted to treat him with respect and asked him what his preferred pronouns are and how he identified himself. And he told me, no, please use masculine pronouns. I identify as a male. I'm attracted to male, but in my office, at least, he was expressing as a female. And that's, a, for me, a good representation of how this gender brand identity works. Everyone falls into this to some degree, whether it's like, again, 100 and 0 or 50 and 50 or 30 and 20 to, in each of these vectors, we all have some degree of the gender bred uh, spectrum. So when we're talking to the patient, it's important to identify this when we're talking to the patient, because we want to find out under the patient's terms what, where they lie on the spectrum. So typical questions I ask them is, well, are you sexually active? When I was in medical school, I was taught, do you have sex with men, women, or both, right? And that was the PC norm way of asking back in the 90s and the thousands, how do you, who, and who do you have sex with? And, you know, now I think it's much easier to have a very open-ended conversation with patients and say, well, are you sexually active? And what does that mean to you, right? So are, some patients are asexual. Some patients have, you know, sex with multiple partners or non-multiple partners or monogamy. And this is all the opportunity to, to let the patient describe to you what their sexual activity may be. Again, if it's important, you know. Um, with whom do you have sex? What body parts do you have sex with? These are all kind of follow-up questions that I sometimes get into. Um, again, we always want to find out that we're, that we're offering our patients safer sex. And again, what does that mean to the patient itself? Um, I always, or try to, ask patients what their gender identity is and what their preferred pronouns are. Again, putting this on the patient's terms. I'm no longer asking the patient, are you checkbox A, B, or C? But I'm asking the patient, can you please describe yourself to me? Who are you? Tell me in your words who you are, not by me checking boxes. With this, we're able to identify support, identify relationships, again, establish pronouns, um, and find out who everybody else is in the room. Oftentimes, I'll ask the patient, um, who is everybody in the room? Uh, because the patient may not associate themselves with the labels of who you say they are. So for instance, in our intakes, um, and I'm not sure how everyone's hospitals may differ, but in our intakes, uh, it says, 
what is your gender, what is your current gender identity? And the word current is in there on purpose because what you are today or who you identify as today may not be who you identify as in a week or two. So even though the, MR, the EMR may say gender identity is something, right? This is a question we should be repeating as the hospital continues to see this patient so that we can continually update this patient's gender identity as they change. Then we ask, well, what does your birth certificate say? What gender were you born with? And what is listed on the government records? And you know, this also went through some debate as well, but the problem which we later learned here at my institution is that a lot of this is tied to insurance and a lot of it is tied to billing. So if I'm saying in my medical record that I have a 68 year old male in every medical record, but the insurance company thinks that this is a 68 year old female, guess who's not getting paid? So it's really important that at least somewhere in the medical record, there is a official gender assigned that the insurance company is going to accept. I can talk to the patient in my terms. I can talk to the patient in words that they will feel comfortable with. But at some point, we have to legally bill for the patient in terms of the insurance company is okay with. And that's the legal de definitions. In some states, that can be circumvented, but in my particular state, it can't. Uh, again, I always ask the patients what pronouns they prefer, especially in the situation that I just described. Um, and then lastly, we ask the patients, well, what do you think yourself as? Again, letting them decide. <clears throat> um, so, you know, everyone makes mistakes and it happens all the time. I do this all the time. I see a lot of patients in this community and I still make mistakes all the time. So, you know, I've tried to change the way I describe myself to patients and try to change the way I talk to patients in my standard kind of rote uh, conversation that we all say a hundred times a day. So, you know, when I ask a patient, Mr. Smith, do you have a girlfriend? Obviously I'm assuming that John Smith goes by Mr. and that he uses masculine pronouns, assumption number one. Then I'm assuming assumption number two, that Mr. Smith is interested in and has sex with women and what's a relationship with women. And number three, I'm assuming that this 25 year old woman next to him is his girlfriend and not his sister or his mom. Um, so that's kind of an, an important assumption to not make. So I tend to ask the patient, John, what pronoun do you feel most comfortable with? Mister, okay. Well, John, can you, who is everybody else in the room? And then he'll say, this is my mom or this is my sister. Alice. Oh, nice to meet you, Alice. And then I ask, Alice, I ask John, is it okay if we talk in front of Alice about your medical condition? Sure. That's a great dialogue to have with a patient because then you can make sure that you're addressing the patient in terms that he or she feels comfortable with. And you're also making sure that everyone else in the room is engaged in the conversation and allowed to be part of the conversation based on the patient's terms and with the patient's permission. Now, as it always happens, what happens if you make a mistake? own it, move on. Oftentimes I've made a mistake and the patient has told me I go by feminine pronouns. And of course, at some point in the conversation, I'm going to switch to masculine pronouns because I'm an idiot. And we all make mistakes. So you just own it. You just say, I'm sorry. You told me that you go by feminine pronouns and I just called you a masculine pronoun. I apologize. Um, please, if I do it again, please stop me. But I will try very hard to use your preferred pronouns. Move on, right? We all make mistakes. You're not the first person to make this mistake with this particular patient, probably, and you're not the last person. So all you really have to do is apologize and move on. Otherwise, it becomes like this elephant in the room that you can't get it past in your brain and you stop thinking about what you're talking about because you're just worried about this mistake you just made. So when it comes to the actual preoperative considerations, you've already done your history, right? You let the patient identify their identity. We talked about this. You ask their pronouns and their preferred name. We talked about this as well. Um, we want to be sure that the EMR agrees with the patient. So as I mentioned before, our legal EMR, our EMR is based on the legal gender that the insurance or the driver's license states that, that patient may be, which may be different than who the patient says they are. So because of that, we have two boxes in our EMR. We have the legal gender, and that's the one that we bill with. And we have the patient's identity gender, which can often, often but can sometimes be discordant. And that's the patient's self-identification. And that's the one we try to use when we're talking with the patient. In our particular EMR, a little flag comes up when there's a discordance. When the patient's legal documentation says they're man, the patient says they're female, we have a little pop-up that says this is, there's a gender discordancy in this patient. 
address kind of address that, right? So you want to be sure that you're addressing to the patient in what they choose and not what the DMV has chosen for them. Um, also remember that these patients sometimes are under a lot of medications, a lot of hormone therapy, some medications that you don't know of, some medications may not be legal. Um, some patients who are transitioning don't feel comfortable going to the doctor. It may not be legal in their particular area to go under transitioning medication. So they may get their medication illegally, especially, I find this very common as patients first enter this transitioning journey where they'll get their meds from Mexico or somewhere else. And uh, we don't know what they are, right? We don't know the purity. We don't know the names necessarily. Um, it can be a hodgepodge of concerns. So, you know, when we're taking a medical history and doing the med rack, um, we want to find out their legal as well as their illegal medications that they may be using in their transitions. Um, sometimes these patients have PTSD from prior experiences. There's a large amount of sexual abuse, in, especially in the transgender population, um, especially if the patient may be a sex worker. So you want to be sure that you offer the patient a chaperone, even if your gender matches the patient's gender. You may ask the patient to get a chaperone or better yet, just make it a policy. So we tend to have a policy here that we chaperone, almost chaperone almost every patient um, just to make it uniform. And so everyone's always on the same page. Now, the second topic is one that's kind of a hot button issue and it comes back a lot. And I think that's how, to be honest, my whole role started because of this. And that is because of pregnancy testing. <clears throat> so we had in our institution a couple of times where uh, a, policy was written that mandated pregnancy testing and the patient was very offended because they did not feel that they fit into this policy and the nurse was caught in the middle. Um, this is a really unfortunate place. So what we did is we went back and we fixed the policy. You know, There's no need in making a nurse upset, a patient upset, the doctor upset, delay the OR only because of a poorly written policy. So that was an opportunity for us to revisit the way the policy is written and maybe change it to a more modern and more acceptable definition. So we used to have a policy that said any woman between ages da 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 and da 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 needed the beta before going back to the OR. Well, obviously things are a little bit more, um, have changed a little bit since that original policy was written. So we changed it. So we change it according to the American Society of Anesthesiology guidelines, which really says any person of childbearing potential. So I don't, again, I don't care what label you are. I don't care what label the computer says you are. I don't care really of anything except for does your body have the capacity of making a baby? If your body has the capacity of being pregnant, then we need to check. If you do not have the capacity of being pregnant, then we don't need to check. Simple as that. So sometimes just making it simpler made it a lot more inclusive, um, which was a lot of Zoom meetings to get to that point when we just decided to roll back as opposed to adding more and more disclaimers into an already very lengthy policy. And so far since we've changed it, thankfully, it's been going very well and been well received. In the, peri in the pre operative area, remember, everyone is squished in. If everyone's pre ops are like the ones I've been to, there's a you know, paper thin curtain that's supposedly soundproof, but everyone knows it's not, that is separating each individual bay and anyone can hear what's going on. So please try to you know, uh, preserve a patient's dignity, close the curtain, limit chatter, don't go back to the nursing station and say, oh, look at the patient in bay three, da, 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 da. I mean, not that we would, but you know how stuff happens. So <clears throat> just be cognizant of that patient's wishes. The last thing in the preoperative setting, which I'd like to call attention to is the labs. So, you know, the labs are all based on norms based on gender. So if a transgender patient is transitioning or a patient is on hormone, exogenous hormones, their labs may not fit who the lab, the lab downstairs thinks that they, how they should fit. For example, let's say you have a, a patient who's transitioning, who is a trans man. So, born female, assigned female at birth, and now is masculine gender, and you draw labs, that patient's labs may resemble more of a feminine lab profile than a masculine profile, meaning they may actually not be anemic because the hemoglobin acceptable range in a female is less than in a biologic male. So remember that some labs may not necessarily coincide with the patient you're seeing. So don't be alarmed by all these, you know, uh, out of range lab that you may see, and it may fit the patient, not who the computer thinks that patient is. The ones that we see most often fall into this category are hemoglobin, LFTs often, especially if the patients are on steroids, 
um, and cholesterol, especially if patients are on uh, testosterone or other steroids. So those are the ones that oftentimes are flagged as being out of range only because the computer and the person don't jive on their sexual identity. Now, once we're made it back to the OR, remember privacy is still important. The patient's asleep, but you really wanna preserve the patient's dignity throughout the whole journey, not just when they're awake. So what we've installed in our hospital is little curtains, which I think a lot of hospitals have now, on the windows going to the OR so that we can close it, so that if you have a patient who's in the middle of a transitioning period or is feeling that you know they want their privacy upheld, we can close those curtains so you don't have a lot of people peeping in. Not that anyone needs any means wrong by looking in, but sometimes curiosity um, can get the better of, patient, of uh, staff members. Uh, venous thromboembolism is super high in these patients, especially patients who are on estrogen. So if you have a trans woman who is on estrogen therapy, their risk of a VTE event or DVT is 20% higher than a woman who's not on estrogen. So because of that, we have to be very, very careful about in making sure that we prevent DVTs in these patients. That includes, of course, heparin sub Q if you're, a, you know, surgeons and the hospitals allow for it, and then intraoperative SCDs uh, going on right away before induction, so that we can mitigate this increased DVT risk to the best of our ability. When it comes time for the actual intubation, remember some patients have had laryngoplasty procedures for, we say, voice feminization to decrease the Adam's apple, to change the vocal cord structure, to make the voice sound a little bit more feminine or more masculine. And some patients have had these procedures done. That can lead to strictures, that can lead to an abnormal anatomy, and sometimes a more difficult intubation. So as in the intraoperative period, you wanna be sure that uh, airway card is available if needed, that this discussion is had with the anesthesia staff before you get there to be sure that this patient's laryngoplasty or voice feminization procedures will not impact the actual intubation. For patients who have had bottom surgery, uh, the Foley catheter actually may be very difficult. Sometimes it's, it's a little bit uh, odd placement of the catheter or strictured or it's angulated, making it a little bit more difficult to actually insert the Foley, um, in which case don't push harder. You know, obviously we all know that to get, seek help and maybe even call urology. There's oftentimes some strictures there. Um, that may make Foley intubation a little bit more difficult. So it's, again, something to be uh, you know, aware of as you roll back into the OR. You know, and lastly, post-operative. Again, we want to follow this patient throughout their stay with us. And we want to, again, continue their DVT prophylaxis, continue their hormones if it's legal in your state. For instance, in my state, it's not legal for me to continue hormones from a patient who was assigned or prescribed hormones in a different state. If they come to Florida, and, I, and they're under 18, I can't continue their hormones. Um, but if that's legal, you wanna continue the hormones. Um, you wanna sign out this patient's preferred name, preferred gender to the PACU staff and to again, to the floor nursing staff. So we have this seamless transition. We don't want this patient coming out to every nurse they see. It's just much more cohesive if the patient comes out, let's say to the first nurse they see, and then that information is seamlessly carried out throughout their hospitalization. We know their diabetic status, so we should also know their sexual orientation and gender identity status as well. Lastly, or not lastly, but I, the next thing I like to do is give family and friend updates about the patient if the patient wants. Sometimes the patients don't want us to tell whoever's driven them here what's going on, uh, in which case, obviously, we respect their privacy and we don't say anything to whoever's driven them. Just because they have a ride does not mean that, that ride is you know, privileged to all their private health information. Depending on your hospital setting, some hospitals will have private rooms or shared rooms. And remember that the hospital policy dictates where these patients go. If there's no hospital policy, I strongly encourage you to maybe consider inquiring in your hospital how these patients are managed. Um, most groups, and including the AMA, all recommend that the patient be roomed with their preferred gender uh, room assignment, and then, if possible, a private room. Um, you know, it depends on the hospital. If you have private rooms, obviously yes, that's a non-issue. But if there is shared, this is, you know, a, another potential stumbling block in hospitals who are not prepared to manage patients effectively. Patients oftentimes have psychosocial issues, mobility issues, financial issues. So we get early consults with social work and case managers to help the patients in whatever they need in that post-op period. There are also some things that we as humans and the hospital itself can do to improve some patient's comfort in coming to see us. 
And these are these uh, socio-cultural factors, I call them. Little things like a welcome sign. So like this equal sign that you see here, um, for those that know, means that this is a center of health equity. This is a center who has been approved by the human rights campaign as delivering excellent care to the LGBT plus community. If you don't know what this means, you're going to walk right by and you're not going to pay any attention to it. Okay, who cares? But for whoever it's important, this could be a sign that, hey, yeah, they get me here. They know me here. They already have policies for rooming assignments. They have policies for who to get a beta ECG on. And they have policies on changing their intake forms. So these are all markers of a hospital with who has taken this patient population into account. Um, again, we talked about a lot of these things already, but confidentiality um, and this reverse discrimination by the patient where the patient may not feel comfortable, so they don't come. So if a hospital, for instance, has policies that are LGBT friendly and has these equality signs and has something on their website about health equality for the LGBT plus population, then that patient would obviously feel more comfortable going where they know they're gonna be accepted and would be more apt to see that physician or to go to that hospital. Patients often require interdisciplinary care. Now, I'm a surgeon, you're all perioperative nurses. And sometimes these patients require care that we don't know about. I, I don't know how to dose testosterone. I don't know how to dose estrogen. So I consult as much as we can because these patients often need multiple physicians, multiple care teams to take care of them in the perioperative setting. So you want to be sure you have people knowledgeable enough to take care of these patients with the way they need to. So this is a study that we did looking uh, at, at Pride, and we asked patients um, about their healthcare experiences. More specifically, are people asking them about their healthcare experiences? So we, when we asked patients, um, are you, the green is always sometimes being asked, and the purple is they're rarely asked or never asked. The first set of bars there is, um, have you been asked about your sexual orientation or gender identity? You can see, at least here in my city, we're doing a horrible job in general in asking. Uh, do you believe that it's important to talk about it? And you can see here on the first group that most patients are not being asked, but the overwhelming majority of patients feel it's important to be asked. So clearly there's a disconnect. We're not doing something that the patients are expecting us to do. Obviously, we have to change. When it comes to the cultural competence and what do physicians and clinicians think that we should be doing, um, we took a survey of all cancer surgeons, all cancer physicians, oncologists um, in the NCI network. And about 55% of patients, or sorry, providers do not ask patients about their sexual orientation or gender identity. About 18% don't really remember if they did or not. And only about a quarter of all physicians, oncology physicians, asked sexual orientation or gender identity questions at any point to their patient during their cancer journey. We then took a look at the NCCN. So for those of you who, who are part of the NCCN hospitals, NCCN is kind of the blueprint of how this country treats cancer. And there's panels and there's groups and say, okay, as a country, we are gonna treat breast cancer in this way with this chemo and this surgery. So we asked each of these panels, which are government run, and we asked them, well, do you have language in your panel regarding treatment of LGBT populations? Um, and about 94% of the panel said that it didn't matter, that there was no difference whether or not the patient was lesbian or straight and had breast cancer, or whether the patient was gay or straight and had prostate cancer. Well, as we talked about, it does matter. We already talked about some of the data and I didn't share with you some of the data, but it, it does matter. So obviously there's a disconnect again in what we think the patients need in terms of clinicians and what the patients actually need. Part of this is due to the lack of medical studies. So when you look at medical studies in the last, you know, 1991 to 2017, there were 764 phase one trials that ended up being uh, FDA approved medications. So these are clinical trials that the FDA used to identify a drug as being good or bad. None of these reported anything to do with sexual orientation, gender identity, or LGBTQ status. So we have no idea how any of these 764 drugs reacted in this population. We have no idea how any of these drugs reacted with hormones that these patients may be taking. In the large cooperative trials, only 20% of trials ask LGBT information, and only 10% ask any gender identity. Clearly, there's work to be done. 
So I'm just going to go through a couple of quick scenarios just so we have some time left over for questions. But the first scenario is one we've already discussed, but you're ready to go back with a 30-year-old trans woman and the nurse is insisting on a beta HCG. Um, again, a lot of this is uh, driven by policy, but I would encourage you to identify what your institutional policies are and change them if they need to be changed. Uh, then this one, you're, you've been asked to help a new clinic design. How do you make the space you know, more accepting? And this one's an easy one. Well, make sure you have a gender neutral bathroom somewhere in this new space. You wanna avoid labeling the women's center. This was a kind of a battle that I tackled last year where we had the women's center where the gynecologists and the breast surgeons were housed and men get breast cancer too. And trans men can have ovarian cancer. So we want to avoid uh, labeling this as the women's center and call it gynecology or breast cancer or ovarian cancer center. Whatever you wanna call it, anything is better than the women's center, right? You want to train your staff on talking to the diversity of patients. Now, we all know how to treat diverse patients, but does the valet driver know how to treat diverse patients? Does the greeter at the front door know? Does the volunteer know? Does the CMA or does the uh, appointment scheduler know? Those are all conversations that should be had throughout every level of an institution. Um, again, we're going to try to reduce some of this binary checkbox medicine. We're gonna to try to ask the patient in their terms to describe themselves, and then we'll document it the way they say it, not the way we wanna document it. Um, I think I'm in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip this one um, and just conclude with the facts that we've been able to identify that LGT patients need specialized care. And a lot of this care is gonna be driven by our knowledge and their terminology. We wanna be sure that our hospital policies and our hospital actions reflect what we already know to be the right way to take care of patients. We want to be sensitive to these particular patients because we know they have sensitive issues. They have special needs that the other patient may not have, and we want to understand them and then carry them through. So again, I can't emphasize enough this transition between preoperative, intraop, PACU, and floor in the patient's journey through transitioning so that we are on the journey with them and that we are telling our colleagues exactly where this patient and who this patient may be. Um, as we, you know, in, in medicine in general, increase our knowledge, this obviously will become a lot easier. But right now, we're just breaking through the medical research in the area. So we want to be sure that we are keeping ahead of ourselves and maintaining our education with seminars just like this to be sure we're able to provide the care that these patients need. So with that, we have about 15 minutes, hopefully, um, to have some questions. So I see there's some chats. And I'll let the group... Um, uh, start asking some of the questions maybe over the top. Okay, Dr. Sanchez, just to get us started here. Um, we have one question. I think this is related to benefits. Um, if they extend now to same-sex partners, do they extend to unmarried opposite-sex partners? They don't have to. That's depending on your state legislation. Um, in my state, it does, it's not necessary. So there are no same-sex partners, uh, no same-sex mandate benefits in our state. Um, there's not even really any marriage benefits in our state, um, but some states do have a marriage benefit clause. Um, I, that is very uh, locale dependent, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so when a person presents um, and asks for treatment as a male, um, let's see, someone is asking why is society at fault um, because they don't get their physical bodies treated? Um, well, you know, maybe I'm having a hard time understanding the question, but I, I think what we're getting at is we want to treat the patient based on their expression or who they say they are, their identity, right? So I think if the patient says they're male, they don't let's say, for instance, you don't think they're a male, or the hospital doesn't think they're male, or Blue Cross doesn't think they're a male. Well, I don't care. It's what the patient thinks, right? Um, and we should treat the patient the way they think, right? What we document or what we bill as may be something different, right? Or what the DMV says, but we should treat the patient. We're here to help them, right? And we got to be sensitive to their needs. Thank you. Okay. And um, so when rooming patients by their identified gender, um, how should we handle cisgender patients who may have some concerns? And that's a great question. You know, that's going to happen, right? That's going to happen all the time. And um, 
you're going to have to kind of just deal with it in a way. That's why we recommend a private room if possible, because that way you obviously avoid that issue and no one feels uncomfortable because the patient gets what they want. So every hospital has a couple of private rooms. You may want to allocate something like that for that patient. And that's a time where in a preoperative discussion or preoperative tumor board setting or whatever the preoperative kind of evaluation may be with the anesthesiologist, this topic is discussed and this topic is kind of sent down to case manager or to the nursing supervisor or whoever does the room assignments in your particular hospital before the actual surgery date. But you get to surgery date, the patient's assigned, obviously the nurses are, uh, nurse managers are gonna have to do some shuffling of rooms to identify where they can move these two patients so they fit. Um, and we're treating both of them. So we have to be sure both patients are comfortable. And I think HIPAA can sometimes complicate that further too, because we wanna respect the privacy of both patients, obviously, exactly. right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, do you ask SOGI questions of every patient uh, who asks the question, i.e., is it registration or um, is it the clinical provider? Yeah, kind, it sounds question. like kind of at what stage? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now that we have it is our SOGI questionnaire is uh, on the tablet. So it's like a very, it's the sheet that I just printed that I showed you on my slide. It's on the tablet where the patient then clicks. I always ask again, and the nurse sometimes asks again, depending on how busy we are. Um, there was an interesting study out of NYU looking at, well, what do patients want? You know, do the patients prefer this anonymous iPad kind of setting? Do they prefer the nurse or do they prefer the doctor? And really, they just really know, want to know why you're asking. They want to know, are you being nosy or do you need to know for another reason? And really, the patients just really wanted an explanation. So in that particular study, if I'm not mistaken, the patients really wanted the nurse to ask because they felt more comfortable coming out, so to speak, to a nurse. Um, that being said, you know, I have patients, I had a patient maybe about a year ago who told everybody up to see me. He told the registration, the iPad people, you know, on the iPad, he told the medical student, he told the nurse practitioner that he was straight. I come in and he told me he was gay. So you just have to keep asking. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. So if we are getting away from using sexual preference, um, and trying to use sexual orientation instead, should the same be said for the phrase preferred pronoun? Um, this person still hears preferred pronoun a lot, um, and they think it's the same idea where it's not necessarily a preference, it's just kind of who they are. So how can we kind of, yeah, you know, I mean, work to- That's a really good thought. I hadn't thought about that, actually. That's a really good yeah. point. Uh, you know, it's super interesting, actually. Um, people still say preferred pronouns, to be honest, and maybe society will move away from this. And then next year when I'm giving the same lecture, I'll say, oh, don't ever say preferred pronouns. That's horrible. Why would you ever say that? Um, but like yeah, I, I guess, you know, that's why I like the idea of having the patient described. So I would say, what pronouns do you want me to use? I bring it always back kind of like on oh, this particular relationship, like uh, what is your gender? What is your sexual orientation? What is your gender identity? What pronouns shall I be talk? What pronouns do you want me to use? And I tend to say that um, instead of being very formal, but I'm just kind of an informal person in general. But um, that's a really good point. And I hadn't thought about that. That's, a, that's an excellent point. All right. Thank you. And it, it's such a weird kind of trying to reconcile everything can be tough. Right, right. And obviously this is all new to, for all of us, right? So this whole topic did not really get discussed 10 years ago, five years ago, maybe five years ago, well, definitely not 10 years ago. So the fact that we're all, all as a culture and as a medical community coming more and becoming more knowledgeable about this means that we're progressing, but we're, we'll never we'll get there, right? Right. Okay. So next question is, Historically speaking, and because of the climate, kind of the health crisis, and some of the stigma around LGBTQ plus populations, um, is there any required reporting to like health departments or other agencies? Um, I think no. we're kind That's of like alluding question. to any like diseases and that sort of right. thing. Okay, well, yeah, I, I guess I'll take that question in two parts. Um, there are requirements for HIV. Um, some of the other requirements depend on your state in terms of sexually transmitted infections, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Um, or your local community. Um, so yes, in that regard, yes, there are some state mandates on infections. Um, right now, we don't have to say how many patients are gay, how many patients are lesbian. Um, that's kind of a problem in my eyes, because, because of that, I can't tell you how many gay patients we have with prostate cancer. And because of that, I can't tell you what the incidence of prostate cancer is among gay men. 
So it's a twofold. So I, I think as our medical science increases, we're going to be able to drill down on those numbers and say, identify patients and say, in this huge study of 20,000 patients, 3% of them were identified as gay. And among those 3% of men who identified as gay men, X percent had prostate cancer compared to the rest were a different number. Y had prostate cancer. And then we're able to compare the two. We don't have that data yet. It's coming. So with Healthy People 2020, that was one of the big initiatives of Healthy People 2020, which is the national survey, to identify patients, uh, sexual gender minorities, and then I'd be able to identify later on as this is among different populations. Okay, and a couple more. Um, can you please expand on uh, the pregnancy testing policy? So like when a patient of childbearing potential um, with childbearing potential anatomy, I'm sorry, insists on a pregnancy test due to their orientation or, or gender identity, what exactly do you do? And it probably insists not having. It. Right, yeah. exactly. And that has happened to us. So um, you, let's say you have a trans male with intact female organs and that patient still has the biologic capacity to have children. Um, and I know that patient is a man and we're not We, I always say, and um, you know, our preoperative nurses are really good at soothing this, and they usually say to the patients, "Well, we want to be sure for your health that you are not pregnant, because if you are pregnant, then this will happen. You can't get anesthesia. The child will be da da da. You know, there are medical consequences to us delivering anesthesia or performing a surgery on a pregnant person. Um, we are not saying that because we're doing a pregnancy test, you are." less male or less female or really anything other than the fact that you can biologically get pregnant. So you biologically get, uh, should be treated for it if you are. Um, there are studies looking at trans patients with intact female organs who you know swear I could never be pregnant, I could never be pregnant and then do get pregnant. So because of that, the American Society of Anesthesiology has recommended what I'm saying is uh, as the kind of a, a safe way to treat patients and a safe uh, policy to offer. Sometimes it does take some soothing and some patients are gonna be mad. There's a patient in New York, I think that's suing one of the hospitals in New York for a very similar policy. Um, I'm curious to see how that goes. That, that lawsuit's about a year old now. Um, I'm just curious to see how it goes because it could change. But the doctor in me says, well, you know, I wouldn't wanna do a surgery on a patient, give them anesthesia if there's a potential teratogenic effect on an unborn child. Very good. Um, and one last question that we have here. Are you aware of any conversations um, taking place uh, among insurance companies and physicians or healthcare providers to incorporate gender identity and sexual orientation and kind of move away from those binary boxes? Yes, the problem is, and this is my problem also, is that these people are all data people. These people are all zero and ones type people. And it's very hard in a practice group of 30,000 people who are covered by this insurance to not have zeros and ones everywhere. Um, and from their standpoint, they need these zero and ones to be sure everything fits. And we all know how insurance companies like to have everything in perfect order in order for them to bill and pay appropriately. Um, so yes, in a perfect world, I agree with you. In a perfect world, this would all be very free flowing. Um, but it, it doesn't fit in the modern kind of uh, system that we have with us right now. In single payer systems, it does fit because let's say at the VA, the gender can be switched and the patient just there's no payer realistically. So uh, it doesn't much matter. But you know, in the private sector where you know some companies are looking for every reason to de deny a claim, we want to be sure that that patient doesn't have a claim denied because of a clerical error that they don't agree with. All right, and we have time for just one last question. Um, how can we educate our coworkers in surgery to be more respectful of anesthetized patients who are in for emergency surgery um, to have objects from their removed from their rectal area? I've yeah, been appalled. Yeah, this person has been appalled by the lack of respect among some of our anesthesia providers and pre-op staff. But um, I do want to touch base on that last question real quick because I forgot to say something. And I always tell the patient. So I tell the patient, yes, it says male and your bill is going to come male and Cigna is going to say you're male. We know you're not, but I want Cigna to pay for your bill. And then usually the, the patient's like, I get it. I get it. This is not the first time this has happened to them. Um, again, I always tell the patient. 
back to this question, that takes a lot of um, emphasis on this is normal. This is every day. This is like taking out an appy. This is like doing a hernia. This is taking out a foreign object. Yeah, everyone's going to be kind of talking about it. But what we can do is not talk about it. What we can do is normalize the situation. So just like anything else, if you normalize it, it becomes a non-issue, right? So instead of saying, oh, can you believe what we just took out of room three? You can say, can you believe how quickly we got the patient in room three in and out and we saved her life from a toxic event? Um, you can change the language a little bit to make it more about the efforts of the team and the positive you did for the patient as opposed to finger pointing, look how crazy that patient is in room three with what they had in their bottom. Humans being human are gonna talk, humans human being, being human are gonna gossip. Um, I do like, you know, curtains. I do like things, you know, quiet in terms of uh, discussion. Um, and then I typically just say a foreign object. Okay, so a foreign object was removed. No other explanations necessary. Does it really matter in PACU or does it really matter in their post-op room what was removed? No, it doesn't. It matters that they had anesthesia and that something was removed. They were worried, maybe worried about perforation or maybe worried about a septic event. Um, but the rest doesn't much matter, so why lead into the gossip? So I shift the focus into something much more positive, and I make it commonplace. I, I, I try not to say, oh, yeah, it was a this, or oh, yeah, I just don't feed into it. I'm just like, yeah, you guys did a great job. Oh, yeah, the team was awesome today. We got that patient into the from the ER to the OR within two hours, and the patient's recovering really well. Everyone did really good for sure. Nothing Excellent. more to say. Perfect. All right, and that is all the time we have for today. Um, for any questions we weren't able to address, um, today we'll be following up afterwards individually. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sanchez, for pre presenting on this important topic. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, I wanna thank everyone here for attending today's session on getting to know your LGBTQ plus patient. Um, to earn contact hours for attending today's presentation, please register using the link that's been provided in the chat. Um, the slides and the recording of this presentation will be um, available on Friday for those who register through the AORN Learning Center. Um, and that concludes today's presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.